Cool, right, cool, let's go. Um, this is a huge presentation, and it's lunch next, so I understand that I can't mess around. Uh, 85 slides to get through. Uh, this talk is CSS for software engineers for CSS developers. Uh, what does that mean? We're going to look at some traditional uh, software engineering paradigms, design patterns, look at how we could apply those to CSS development uh, so that we as CSS developers can utilize the kind of traditional patterns and principles that programmers have been using for decades, right? So it's going to be looking at uh, some very specific patterns and paradigms. Um, but before we do that, I want to start with a real brief history lesson, a really, really brief history lesson. And it starts with these two. Uh, this is my mum and dad on their wedding day in 1984. Uh, I've asked my mum several times, and she doesn't know what she was thinking either. Um, that guy didn't even get a haircut for his own wedding. Look at that. How bad is that? Um, but yeah, so these two are um, really important to me, obviously very important to me. They're my parents. Um, but they also provide me with this really interesting, very specific professional benchmark, this very, very personal professional benchmark. That benchmark is the fact that they were both born in 1959. Uh, 1959 is quite a significant year because as well as being the birth year of my parents, it's widely regarded as being the birth year of the first modern programming language. Uh, the first modern program programming language, obviously quite a contentious issue, is widely regarded as being uh, Flowmatic. So Flowmatic was a language designed in the 50s, released in 59. Um, and the reason we consider it the first programming language is it was the first one that used actual sort of human readable words to manipulate data. Uh, entirely electronic, computer-based, and used human-readable words. Uh, it was developed by a woman called Grace Hopper. Has anybody, has anybody heard of Grace Hopper? That's not enough hands. Yeah, big ups, right? Grace Hopper's amazing. Um, check her out. She's uh, a really, really important figure in modern computer science. She did a lot of work with the US Navy, um, the military, uh, and she's one of the, the first ever proper computer programmers, and a lot of her work has been very influential uh, so Flowmatic went on to influence things like COBOL, Fortran. Uh, if anybody has seen any sort of archival footage uh, of Grace Hopper, you probably get the impression she's a bit of a badass, right? She's got a very can-do attitude, and nothing sums that up better uh, for me than this. Uh, Grace went to her managers at a company called Rand, and she suggested this idea of a human-readable programming language. And her managers just didn't even think it was possible. They were just like, yeah, probably not doable. Um, and instead of being disheartened, instead of just abandoning uh, any attempts, she rolled her sleeves up and just did it anyway, uh, which I think is fucking awesome. It meant that she had uh, a spec um, for 1955. And 1959, she had the first version. Her and her team had the first version of Flowmatic out there and working. So back to this weird professional benchmark. Uh, this gives me really good context. Knowing this sort of 1959 uh, kind of time gives me a really good personal timeline that frames the work that I do. So in 1959, uh, Flowmatic and my parents were born, right? So roughly, modern computer science is about the same age as my parents. That gives me a really sort of tangible way of considering the history of our industry. Uh, in 1990, uh, I came along. And in 1996, uh, my youngest sister and CSS arrived. Um, I've given this talk a few times. My sister still doesn't know that slide's in there. Uh, what I find really interesting is she started her life as a short, fat man. Um, yeah, so um, CSS and my youngest sister are both exactly the same age. So thinking about the difference between my parents and my sister is basically the difference between modern computer science and the work that I do. It gives me a really, really good grasp of just where my work sits in a wider context. This 37 years... Uh, of difference between the two has a lot of very, very rich history. Uh, we tend to think that front-end development only recently got difficult, or that we only recently need to start thinking about performance or architecture's abstractions. Programmers have been solving this since the, since the late 50s, right? Programming has been difficult since day one. Uh, we're not really solving many new things in a sort of philosophical context. So we've got this massive chunk of history where programmers have been solving problems that never even existed before. It's a huge chunk of history that we as front-end developers can and should look to just to beg, steal, and borrow as much as we can. I've made no excuse or apology that for the, most of, for the majority of my career, I've just stolen things from computer scientists. I read about paradigms and design patterns from uh, traditional computer science, and I try and apply it to front-end. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this talk. We're going to look at some specific principles and how we can apply those to CSS.
The first principle I want to talk about is the dry principle. Who's heard of dry? Show of hands. Most of us, right? It's a fairly simple principle. Uh, some slight caveats, which we'll discuss. Uh, who's heard of the single source of truth? Slightly fewer hands, that makes sense. I like to think of the single source of truth as the more philosophical principle that sits behind dry. So dry, meaning don't repeat yourself, just states that every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Now, there's a really important word on this slide which I've unfortunately neglected to highlight, and that word is knowledge. A lot of people misunderstand dry and believe that dry is uh, an attempt to never repeat anything at all in a code base. Uh, that's just not practical. It's not really achievable. Uh, dry is about avoiding the repetition of knowledge, key information. Uh, dry is not a performance principle. Dry doesn't exist to make your code faster or smaller. It ends up doing that sort of circumstantially. But first and foremost, dry exists just to ease maintenance, to make maintaining systems much simpler. So every discrete uh, piece of information should exist only once. Uh, if a piece of information uh, isn't discrete, if it happens to exist twice because it literally is two separate bits of information that happen to be the same, uh, we shouldn't dry these out. Uh, dry is all about spotting key bits of uh, shared information and only writing it once. Um, has anybody ever inherited a CSS project where you make a change somewhere and nothing happens, and then you work out that you need to change it in three other places as well? Anyone had that happen to them? It's just really annoying, right? It's not to do with like, how fast the program runs. It's just annoying to have to make those changes. So dry is all about maintenance. Repetition is extra overhead. It's more to go wrong. It's more to maintain, uh, more to just think about. It's a nasty way of working. Let's look at a real simple example of dry uh, in CSS. I imagine most of us will have seen uh, helper classes like this before in frameworks, little utility classes just for nudging margins around. Um, what we're going to see here is that we've got this 12 pixels repeated four times. Now, this 12 pixels is clearly information. It's knowledge. This 12 pixels has something to do with potentially like a baseline grid or a spacing unit. The fact this exists four times isn't a problem as far as performance is concerned. It's just annoying that if 12 changes to 15, we have to change it in four places. We have to remember to change it in four places. Real simple way of getting rid of this, just stick it in a variable. I presume we, most of us will use preprocessors. Uh, this is about the simplest example of drying CSS as uh, I could think of. Um, so the single source of truth is the result of having this dried out CSS. We dried the CSS, uh, and we got a single source of truth. Dollar unit is the single source of truth. Slightly more detailed example. Um, so it's this key knowledge, right, this key information thing I mentioned. Here we've got three rule sets that are completely unrelated. They have nothing to do with one, any, uh, one another. However, we've got this thematic repetition. Every time we declare this custom font, we also need to declare this custom font size. If we change, uh, sorry, font weight. If we change the custom font, we're going to have to go through and change every instance of font weight 700. That's just going to be a laborious, boring task. Here, what I would recommend is leaning on a mix-in and use it as a sassy copy and paste. Um, has, has anybody heard the saying that argumentless mix-ins are bad? Has anybody heard that? Just me, wow. Um, OK, so argumentless mix-ins are typically looked, uh, looked on as an anti-pattern because they just spit out the exact same code with no difference. Uh, it just leads to bloat. Uh, that's not true. That's not a problem. That's not an issue. Argumentless mix-ins can be seen as a, like a sassy copy and paste. Now, this leads to the exact same output. We still get the exact same amount of repetition in our compiled CSS. But that shouldn't bother us, right? Because dry does not exist for small file sizes. It exists purely to make maintenance, uh, maintenance of CSS, or any program, rather, uh, much simpler. So dry is all about saving work and not about saving file size. Uh, the single source of truth is the practice of structuring information uh, so that it's stored exactly once. So what we do is we do the dry. We dry things out. We don't repeat ourselves. And that will end up giving us this single source of truth. Um, this gives us a lot more confidence. If we know we've got a key bit of information stored only once, we know that we need to change it in one place, and the entire program will act accordingly. So a single source of truth uh, just gives us a lot more confidence when manipulating or extending or working with an existing system. And it just keeps things nice and tidy, kind of nice and, uh, and encapsulated. It keeps our house in, in order. So uh, use a preprocessor to store key data in variables or in mix-ins. Um, don't draw anything that is purely coincidental. So if uh, three things are kind of unrelated, 
uh, but happen to share the same strings. Don't force weird abstractions around that. Um, misuse of extends is a really good example of failing to understand the dry principle. Uh, if it's purely coincidental repetition, repeat it. There's a really nice saying in computer science that repetition is better than the wrong abstraction. Cool, right, nice simple one to start with. Who's heard of the uh, single responsibility principle then? Let's move on to this one. Single responsibility principle. The single responsibility principle is really, really good. It's probably the most kind of, uh, you'll get the most bang for your buck by following this one principle. Out of all of this slide deck, this is probably the single most effective one. So it states that every class should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality, blah, 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 blah. There's some very long-winded definitions for these things. All we really care about is the single responsibility principle tells us to do one thing, one thing only, and do that one thing very, very well. Uh, single responsibility principle is also paraphrased as um, everything should have one reason to change. So everything should handle just one discrete bit of functionality. Uh, so there's only one thing you could ever actually change within that context. Basically, what it does is it takes big tasks and breaks them down into much smaller individual chunks, right? We break down big, complex monoliths and then recompose them out of the smaller individual tasks. Now, there's a really surprising uh, metaphor for the single responsibility principle, a real-life metaphor, uh, and that is Subway, right? The sandwich restaurant. Uh, restaurant. Now, if you've been to Subway before, you will know that you don't really go in and order a sandwich because you get presented with this, right? You select this ingredient with this bread, with this salad, with this sauce. This is the single responsibility principle. We're breaking down the idea of a, a full meal, and we're giving consumers the ingredients, and they can put it together themselves. This is a really, really good example of a single responsibility principle working in the real world. Um, breaking things down to their smallest possible parts means that we can uh, put different combinations together very quickly. We can swap things out. We can be very modular and granular with how we work. Uh, it helps us separate our concerns. A principle we will look at uh, shortly is the separation of concerns. But it gives us incredible opportunity and flexibility. So much so that at Subway, you can actually make 6,442,450,944 unique sandwiches. And they all taste identical. <laughs> um, you can actually make 6.4 billion sandwiches at Subway just because they adhere to the single responsibility principle. Being able to compose and combine the same ingredients in different uh, orders gives us a huge opportunity to make unique things with very little overhead. Uh, our CSS, and indeed any software, should probably follow the single responsibility principle so that we write things once and then get high reuse. To look at a more practical example, um, here we've got a monolithic sandwich. Uh, and this monolithic sandwich is going to be real hard to extend, modify, change. You know, if someone's gluten-free, they're stuck with like, inappropriate bread. If someone doesn't like, uh, someone's vegetarian, we can't really do much to this sandwich to fix that. It's a monolithic sandwich. Simply by breaking it down into its individual responsibilities, single reasons to change, we can create that exact same sandwich again, but without any overhead, without any extra sort of building monoliths, we can combine these single responsibilities, get the exact same output. That means that if, like me, you don't really like tomato, you can get rid of it. Just don't include it, and you're not affecting anyone else's work. So the single responsibility principle is about providing developers with the ingredients. If you're working in a team where people consume your work, if you're working a team where you're building your own style guide, uh, provide developers with ingredients. Try not to be too opinionated. Give developers the ingredients that they need to build whatever they want. So yeah, an actual dev example then. Um, we see CSS like this all the time, right? There's a few things wrong with this. Uh, the first one, in my opinion, is just the name button login. Uh, we're describing a specific use case that's instantly making this component very hard to reuse. Uh, but we're mixing responsibilities here. We've got some base responsibilities. We've got some uh, structural and some cosmetic responsibilities all handled under this one class name. Uh, the problem with this is we've got three reasons to change here. So the single responsibility principle is about having one reason to change. There are three things that could possibly change inside this class. We need to split those out into their individual single responsibilities. So we get this combinable, composable way of working. We can build that exact same button, but the color of it is optional. The size of it is now completely optional. Uh, much nicer way of working, and we can extrapolate this into things that we've probably seen a lot of. We see kind of this kind of stuff all the time. Uh, just a suite of highly combinable, composable things here. We can get all the same buttons we had before, but without limiting ourselves to specific use cases, uh, opinionated look and feel, we're providing ingredients for developers to make their own UIs.
The next principle then, the separation of concerns. Who's heard of this one? Yeah, quite a lot of us. I feel there's a lot of misconception around what the separation of concerns actually means. It, it's uh, kind of a constant cause of uh, debate and argument in the work that I do. Um, if you look up the actual dictionary definition, or the actual sort of, uh, sorry, original definition of the single responsibility, uh, sorry, the separation of concerns, you get this really eloquent, beautiful description. Uh, I won't read this out to you, but if you hit the Wikipedia page for the separation of concerns, we get this really, really nice, very well-written uh, definition. The separation of concerns, again, isn't about performance. It isn't about writing good quality code. It's about writing understandable code. Right? They are kind of the same thing, but the first and foremost reason for having a separation of concerns is so you can think about things in isolation. Uh, each thing is responsible for itself and nothing more. Uh, it means that you can study and reason about features in complete isolation. The example is, uh, is on Wikipedia is something like, um, you should be able to look at a program on Monday and just study its syntax and nothing else. But on Tuesday, you should be able to look at the exact same program and study its features without having to worry about the syntax. And on Wednesday, you should be able to look at the exact same program and think about its performance without having to worry about its syntax or its features. What it allows developers to do is focus on specific tasks at a time. It means that you can make changes to one thing quite safely without risking damaging or reverting anything else. Uh, in CSS, examples are uh, we shouldn't write CSS against non-CSS classes. So we shouldn't see any .js hyphen classes inside our CSS files. Uh, we shouldn't write selectors that are full of HTML. We shouldn't write a selector like header ULLIA because that's putting a lot of HTML information into our CSS. What that means is we can't refactor our, our market without risking breaking our styles. A separation of concerns tells us that we should be able to worry about the HTML and not even think about the CSS. Uh, to write HTML-like selectors completely destroys that separation of concerns. Uh, don't bind CSS onto data attributes. And to take it even further, don't bind JavaScript onto data attributes. Data attributes are your data layer. They are for containing data. They are not a hook. They're a, like a, a content thing, right? They hold data. And don't bind JavaScript onto CSS classes. This is quite a common one. Uh, people will write uh, some CSS uh, for a bit of UI, and that UI might need some functionality. And then they'll write some JavaScript, which grabs onto the exact same class, which means you can't have one without the other. We can't refactor the HTML without risking breaking behavior and CSS now. Um, so a couple more examples then. So role equals navigation. Um, I see selectors like this all the time. The problem with a selector like this is role equals navigation has nothing to do with CSS. It has nothing to do with styles. It does not belong inside a style sheet. It's an accessibility hint for assistive technologies and browsers, right? It has nothing to do with CSS. Oh, the second one, header nav ul li a. There, is a. there are a lot of things wrong with selectors like this, but the one we're worried about right now is that we can't change our DOM structure without breaking our styling. We have completely ruined that separation of concerns. We can't edit one thing without having to worry about the next. And that's a bad way of working. The third one, does anyone even remember this? Right? We actually used to use HTML to provide styling. The reason CSS was invented was because of this terrible separation of concerns. Here, our content layer is also managing our styling layer. That's a really nasty way of working, because we literally cannot change our HTML without destroying how it looks. And the final one, again, is that binding JavaScript onto styling hooks. If we need to modify the nav using JavaScript, we should use a JS hyphen nav class. Uh, take the top one a little further, then. Um, as responsible developers, we probably all write our HTML first. Um, and we might finish marking up a nav, and we end up with some HTML that looks like this. And we think, oh, brilliant. This is going to be really easy to style now, because I've already got a hook in the market that I can use. So we go off and write some CSS that looks like this. Now, this is awful, 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 awful CSS. Um, first and foremost, that role equals navigation has nothing to do with styling. It does not belong in a style sheet. It's not for CSS. And the second reason is we're loading our CSS with DOM information. Our, our style sheet is now beginning to look like HTML. It means that we can't worry about the look and feel of a page without also simultaneously having to worry about if we've got the correct DOM structure. So the way we should have written this HTML is, uh, is quite a big shift away from what we had before. We should actually write our HTML like this. Now, that looks pretty formidable. It looks pretty scary. But there's a good reason why we should write our markup and indeed our CSS as a result like this. We've separated every concern into its own single responsibility. We've got our semantic concern first. We made a decision about the semantics of this HTML. 
After we made that decision, we should stop worrying about it. We should be able to completely forget that we use these elements and move on to our next concern, which was our accessibility concerns. We should be able to forget all about the semantics of this bit of HTML, because now we're dealing with the accessibility hints. Then after we've solved that, we should be able to move away again and discuss our stylistic concerns. We shouldn't care what HTML elements we're using at this point, what sort of accessibility traits this has, because all we're worried about now is how this looks. And finally, behavioral concerns. So what we do is we split every discrete thing into its own job. As a general rule, your HTML, if it needs to do sort of five things, there should be five discrete hooks or decisions in there. Trying to hang everything off of one sort of role attribute uh, is just a really nasty way of working because we have tied all of these separate concerns into one. We have completely ruined the separation of concerns. <sighs> Next one, uh, immutability. I guess most of us have heard of immutability, show of hands. Yeah, immutability very in vogue right now with the sort of functional and, uh, and JavaScript community. Uh, I find immutability applied to CSS a real interesting concept. Um, CSS is full of mutations. CSS isn't a, isn't a very nice language at all. Uh, immutability deals with uh, the lack of mutations in a program. So an, immu an immutable object is one whose state cannot be modified after it has been created. How good does that sound, right? This just gives us so much confidence when working with programs. We know that when we observe something, it will always be the exact same. It means it's predictable. It means we can act confidently and quickly. Uh, it means that we don't have this kind of Schrodinger, you know, how and when we observe it affects what it behaves like. Um, it, reduces cognitive, it reduces cognitive overhead, right? You don't have to remember that, okay, well, actually, this class in this part of the page does that, but in this part of the page, it does something else. Unfortunately, CSS is designed almost completely around mutations. Uh, there are certain parts of CSS that mutate really badly. Uh, we will look at how, to at how to mitigate the effects of that. First example, we've probably seen stuff like this all the time, right? Uh, an open source grid system, we see this call six class, it's just part of a, uh, like a, a column layout. And then on smaller screen sizes, we've got this very opinionated decision that says, okay, now call six is just 100% width. Uh, we're just going to collapse all the grid system into one column for small devices. Now, there's obviously problems with the design decision there, but the problem we want to look at right now is we've got a mutation. Call 6 has one input, call 6, but two outputs. It could either be width 50% or width 100%, and that depends on how and when we observe this class. That's a mutation. It leads to a lack of confidence, and we've got this increased cognitive overhead of remembering that oh, no, on small screens it should do that, but on big screens I expect it to be different. Um, this is particularly common in CSS. CSS is largely designed around mutation. Responsive web design is mutation. Uh, it's a very mutable way of working with UIs. This specific example, this, this, uh, this helper class, though, we can do things to mitigate the effects. We can actually prevent this from mutating at all. Uh, we can just use another class. Uh, I call these responsive suffixes, and what this basically says is uh, call 6 is width 50%, but call 6 with an at sm on the end does something completely different. Now, there's actually a big topic behind this, so I will tweet the related article that explains these things. Don't worry about understanding it right now. But basically, now we've got two inputs and two outputs. We've got call six and call six at small. We've got two completely different classes. We don't have any mutation across either of them. Uh, it means that wherever we observe each one, we know exactly how it's going to behave. Another example of a mutation in CSS. Um, we've got this bit of CSS and a small HTML snippet here. Now, the more astute among you may have noticed a problem. Uh, we've got a specificity mismatch here. The selector subcontent h2 has a higher specificity than our helper class text center. Uh, that means that the h2, even though it's got a class of text center applied to it, will be text align left. How bizarre is that? That's a very awful way of working, having to work out this kind of specificity mismatch, and your text center class does almost the complete opposite. So in CSS, because it all operates in the global namespace, parts of the code base can affect completely unrelated bits. It gives us very unpredictable outcomes that are very hard to chase around. Uh, lots of unexpected side effects. Uh, this is fixable. And uh, for unfortunately, uh, Gunnar kind of uh, gave you a bit of a spoiler on uh, uh, the other day. The fix here is stick an important on it, right? I do tell clients, don't use important in anger, right? Don't use it to get yourself out of a, out of a, 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 a troublesome situation. But when we're dealing with utility classes and helper classes, 
we should use important. This is the only time I want to see developers using important, because what we're saying here is, I want the class of text center to always be text align center. There's literally no way I would want it to do anything else. We don't want text center to be text align left ever. It just literally doesn't make sense. So we force immutability in CSS by using important. Huge caveat, only do this on utility classes. Use important proactively, not reactively. Uh, another mutation occurring in CSS, um, nesting, right? Nesting creates a mutable state immediately. What we're saying here is we've got a button and a button if it's inside this. Uh, one class, two outcomes. One input, two outputs. The input here is button, but it behaves in two different ways depending on how and when we observe it. Real simple fix for this is just use a BEM modifier, right? Create a second class to provide that functionality. This does a few things, like it reduces location dependence, it reduces specificity, it's a little more resilient. Uh, but mainly, right now, it's fixing this mutation. We don't have a button that behaves two different ways in two different places. We've got two discrete separate classes. So immutability tells us not to have several states of the same thing. Uh, in CSS, we can use modifiers in BEM, like button dash dash large, or responsive suffixes, like col6 at small. Uh, on our utility classes, we can use uh, important to force immutability. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're removing states, conditions, and caveats. We're making sure that we have got a very, very simple way of working. Um, unfortunately, this is actually a trimmed down version of this talk, so the last bullet point doesn't actually make sense. Um, I will share the full slide deck for this talk at the end, uh, but this doesn't bring us nicely onto anything, something completely different. Uh, the open-close principle. Who's heard of this one? OK, a few of us. Uh, who here works in an existing or legacy application? Who's working with legacy CSS? Right, OK, this one's for you. The open-close principle is a really, really nice principle to follow if we are working with existing code bases. The open-close principle uh, is a really, really nice principle in kind of hostile environments where we might expect or have to deal with regressions and collisions. Unfortunately, it's also really badly named. Um, the open-close principle 50% uh, of the useful information is missing from its title. The open close principle basically says that um, software entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. What this means is that if we've got something that exists, we should never modify it. We shouldn't go back and change it. We should add any modification via extension. What this basically means is um, imagine it's January and you've built some buttons for the site and you sort of committed them, pushed them to the shared repo, and then everybody else is using your buttons for the next six months, right? So we've fast-forwarded, and we're in it's June. And you decide that, you know what, I want the buttons to be a, be a bit larger. So you go into the button class, and you make the button larger. The problem we've got here is you've got six months of dependency that you're just going to sort of walk all over. We, uh, we've got this kind of, uh, we've got a bunch of developers using some code that we wrote six months ago, and we're just saying, that, well, actually, I've changed my mind now and all of your six months of dependency, I'm going to change. I'm going to change it at the core, and that's going to trickle through. And that's how we get regressions, collisions. That's how we end up undoing things uh, by accident. So the open-close principle tells us or helps us to avoid doing this. Uh, never change anything at source. Once you've got something out there, never go back and change it at its source. It's analogous to Git history. right? We shouldn't rewrite Git history if we've got people using our work. Uh, it's analogous, analogous to Semver. So Semvo, we can't go backwards. Even if we add a slight change, we have to keep moving forwards. So the open close principle is that, but directly for programming. It avoids the domino effect of changing something, we, a decision we made very early on. And it allows us to add sort of a changed opinion or a changed decision very, very safely and discreetly. We can add new functionality without actually affecting anything that happened before. Everything should be open to extension, closed for modification. Um, Slight caveat, then, there is one instance in which we are allowed to go back and change something, and that's only if it was genuinely a bug. If we genuinely made a mistake, if there's an error in the program, if there's a bug in our CSS, we are allowed to go back and change it. Um, the implementation of class could only be modified to correct errors. New or changed features would require that a different class be created. That class could reuse con coding from the original via inheritance. This is basically exactly how CSS works, right? We make a class, and we can do a dot button and a dot button dash dash large to make it bigger. We extend it rather than changing the button itself. So once we made this decision, once this is out there, once we've got this and people are using it, it's very, very risky to go back and change it directly. Changing this class is going to have knock-on effects. 
What we could do is promo.button, but the problem with this, as discussed, is this is a mutation. We're mutating button now. It's got two different states. Um, we're modifying the base button class directly. The option we have left is to extend this button. To make that button larger, we create a brand new class. This solves the uh, mutation problem. This now makes this a bit of immutable UI. But also, we've uh, extended rather than modified. It means that we don't accidentally regress anybody else's work. We've created a brand new class that they have to implement to get these changes. So it's a very safe way to make these changes. It's a very safe way to extend functionality. Um, the word safe seems a bit dramatic here, but if anybody's worked in a legacy project, uh, it's very, very risky. It's very scary to go back and change something because you know that you've potentially got to check the entire site for weird sort of side effects, or you just don't bother changing it, and, uh, and we use the open-close principle, right? We add a new class. The way I describe this, uh, it's a pretty forced analogy, so please bear with me. Imagine uh, like an action film, right? And you've got two people, uh, rather, you've got one person wants to kind of launch a missile, and they've got to lift up a little red flap, and there's a button underneath it, and they press the button, and it launches the missile. Now, normally, what you'd have is one of those buttons here, and then five meters away, you've got another button, which means that one person can't press both at the same time. You need two people to lift up the red flap, press the button at the same time as each other, and it launches the missile. I warned you this is a very forced analogy, but what happens here is we've got a very destructive decision, right? The destructive decision is, do we launch this missile or not? So we force people to have an agreement. We make sure that two people decide the exact same action, and they implement it at the same time. It means that we can't have a one-sided decision. We have an agreement. Now, the way this transfers to CSS is if we were to open up our text editor, write a selector like .promo space .btn, hit save, go to our browser and refresh, that button inside the promo area will get larger. That's a one-sided change. If we go into our CSS file and create a new class of button dash dash large, hit save, go to the browser, refresh, nothing happens. Because what we have to do is go back to our text editor, open index.html, put the class in there, save the HTML file, then refresh the browser, then something happens. So the open close principle creates a contract between our HTML and CSS. It means that we can't make a one-sided change that gets pushed out. We have to make a change in the CSS and a corresponding change in the markup before any new thing takes effect. This is how we avoid regressions in CSS. This is how we write CSS so that we don't accidentally undo or revert other people's work. So if you work in any kind of shared environment or any legacy project, uh, the open-close principle will protect you from accidental regressions and collisions. Right, OK, I've sprinted through those. Uh, that's the last one. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And I think, uh, I guess, lunch.